Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Um, we are doing some virtual programming for our exhibition, After Hours, Artwork by State of Ohio Employees. Today, we get to hear from Michael Bush, one of our artists. So um, a little bit about this exhibition. You know, this is the third iteration. The first time it came through, it was, gosh, early, early, early on in the life of the Rife Gallery. Um, the last time was four years ago, and now we have it this year. Really fantastically appointed show that was juried by Ken Emmerich, uh, former State of uh, Ohio Arts Council employee. So really nice kind of uh, knit together bit there. A little bit of housekeeping. We're going to do question and answer at the end. So feel free to keep yourself on mute if you wanna turn on your video so Michael can see you, that's great. If not, that's okay too. Uh, we do have closed captioning, so you can select whether or not you'd like to see that or what size as a part of your Zoom controls. And additionally, if you do have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat or into the comments on Facebook and we'll be sure to get to them. Without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Michael Think it's going to be a treat. Enjoy. Thanks, Kat. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Bush. I'm a, a local artist here in Columbus, Ohio, and um, and a state employee for the Ohio Public Employees Retirement System. Um, wanted to get get started into a little bit of my history and going back and talking about the early life. That we're going to go into a little bit about the inspiration about what 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 started me into making art. Uh, the process that I use to make the work and, you know, go over the artwork that I've, I've done over the last uh, probably 14, 15 years. And then what's what's next? So. So I started out, I was born in Gary, Indiana. Uh, my mom was from Columbus and she was a graduate of Columbus East High School. And my dad was from Gary, Indiana. Uh, she moved there with him. And I spent my summers here in Columbus uh, as a child. Um, but when in Gary, my mom and I would take a lot of, since we're so close to Chicago, we take a lot of uh, little small excursions to Chicago and do things like go to museums and go to galleries. Uh, so we spent a lot of time doing that. And uh, also with my paternal grandmother, we did that a lot. Uh, when I came to Columbus and, you know, in the summer times, I would do that with my grandmother. You know, we'd go to the fair, we'd go to the museums, go to COSI, things like that. So uh, those, those women always sh helped shape my love of art and um, you know kind of gave me a, a a blueprint of how to kind of enjoy art from a from a child standpoint uh, but i moved to columbus in 1992 and graduated from columbus east high school in 1993. after that i joined the army and went in the army reserves for six years and uh while doing that also played basketball at columbus state and got my first job at uh my first full-time job at Nationwide Financial, uh, working in the individual annuities area. From the time of 97 through 2007, when I worked there, worked in individual annuities, group pensions, um, and had a really good time working in Nationwide. Uh, in 2004, 2005-ish area, I started doing uh, art therapy, uh, going through some rough patches in life, uh, you know, sought out therapy. And the therapist at the time, you know, said, what about art, you know? I had a friend, Brian Rome, who's an artist who, you know, inspired me a little bit as well to get started in that, that journey. So, you know, that was a good, that was a good way to get my foot wet with learning a little bit about how to make art, you know. In 2008, I started my first career or my first job with Ohio, or started my job with, excuse me, with Ohio Public Employees Retirement System. And it's first time being a state employee, you know, I've been very lucky to, to work there. Uh, at the same time of starting that job, maybe a couple of months later, I moved into my first art studio at Junction View Studios. Uh, you know, rest in peace, Junction View. Uh, back in 2008, was there from there to 2011 when I moved to 400 West Rich. So, and I've been at 400 West Rich now for since then, so 10 years going on this year. All righty. Now, I talk about inspiration, you know, like some of the, the work that I gravitated to towards as a child was definitely Monet, Rothko, and, and a kid who grew up watching a lot of Yo! and TV raps. Uh, Keith Haring's work was very inspirational back then, too, because I just, you know, seeing art 
in the subways, on jackets, like everywhere, you know. So those are, you know, three of my biggest inspirations. And you can see with especially with Rothko and with Monet that I tend to lend a lot of my work started out early, started going based on like my interpretations of what I was trying to recreate in their work. Okay. So the process of making my work, you know, I always joke it is a science experiment. Um, it was a happy accident that I've been able to kind of craft. But, you know, I use, a, I'm really big on texture and color, color and also fluidity in my work. I want to make sure that I'm trying to bring aspects of each of those into each piece that I make. Uh, but what I've started to do is using like a watering down, like of acrylic paint. And I usually use a heavy body studio paint to get that started, uh, watering it down and which can, you know, depend on how much and how, uh, how thick I need the paint to be and how fluid I want the actual paint to blend. Uh, I use, then I use a, a, just a general black spray paint and kind of, use that to break up the paint as well as create these dark lines. And then I use an enamel spray to break that black paint up. So it kind of gives you a little bit of the, you know, what it does here in words, but um, the next slide, we're going to be able to show you a little bit of what I'm doing in that. One. So started off with some uh, watered down acrylic, there, just some white acrylic. Pardon the shakiness, um, but using a little bit of the black spray paint, as you see, the black spray paint starts to break up, create lines, create movement in there, and then a little bit of the enamel to kind of break that up a little more. Then go in and add a little bit more color. As you see, it's just, it's, it's a movement the whole time. It's, you know, just playing around. And, you know, add a little more color there and give it a little bit more of that, that enamel, crystal clear enamel spray. Anyone that's seen my work in person, you know, it's very shiny and glossy. <laughs> so that's where a lot of that comes from. That was totally my bad. Apologies, folks. I was trying to make sure that I um, was asking you while we were watching this really great video, uh, mm -hmm. Michael, for you to tell us a little bit about like how how many layers do you do? Like how long does it take to to like? Do you have to wait for it to completely dry and then do you go back in? Tell tell me a little bit more. Yeah. So it it is a, it's a it's definitely a process. So. Uh, this is like an initial pour. So this will get, you know, the first layer. Then, you know, I go in after that with paint and kind of like highlight around it and then do another pour, um, you know, give it time to dry. But uh, I always joke that in this, you know, the more humid it is and in, in, in the space that I'm actually making the work, the faster it dries. And, and, you know, sometimes it's just, it'll take days. Sometimes it takes weeks to dry. And sometimes before the paint even finishes, even settling, it's dry. <laughs> so uh, a, a typical painting can, this, this process can go on for a good six, seven, eight different layers. But what I will do is keep sections of it highlighted so you can still see where the beginning came from and all the way to the end. But as you see here, so once this dries, um, you know, what I would do is where the white section is, I would go in and paint that a color and then do a pour over that because, the, you know, the background actually does play a lot in how transparent and translucent the work gets. So, but this is one of my very first paintings, uh, nightlife. This was watercolor when I was still figuring everything out, but you can see it's, it's, very much in the vein of like Rothko's work. I, you know, I wanted to do more of study. I was doing a lot of color studies in those sense where I was playing with depth and texture and wanted to give this idea of almost like a, like a landscape feel. Okay. 
again, uh, Commons of Bomb is another example where it's just where I'm, I'm doing the using watercolors, and this is before even painting. This was all brushwork, but uh, trying to play with like fluidity in this piece. I wanted this to look as fluid as possible, almost like a rainstorm, uh, but weirdly like a mushroom cloud. Like you know, just you know, there's beauty in everything in that sense. Again, in this this concept of being such a, a fan of Rothka, I just wanted to play with a lot of negative space and still have defined defined sections to show a little bit of color. But that's, this one is still in my permanent collection, <laughs> my personal collection. Again, this is like coming into where I was starting to work with a little bit more in the, uh, I, I joked that I was trying to get into the Monet palette <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine has this piece and, you know, every now and then I just get a, a reminder of it and it, it inspires me to keep pushing. But I, this is one of my favorite pieces from 2010. This was, this was, these were all done at Junction View Studios. The very first one that was, was uh, done at home when I, you know, first started out. But everything else has been done. These are all done at Junction View Studio when I was there. Yet another one, you know, just loving like trying to make these landscapes that weren't landscapes back then <laughs> um one of my favorite pieces still now this is where this is the first time that the pouring started taking place this is right as i was getting ready to move out of junction view uh my friend brian uh rome who's one of my you know big inspirations on you know the art world is and been a great friend of mine for years gave me a bunch of house paint he had you know and Laid, had a, had this masonite panel on the floor and one of the cans of paint fell down. So I'm like trying to do everything I can to save the canvas. So I'm adding water and then, you know, just started to make this big puddle down there. And it started, and I started to see this movement and this fluidity and this texture and took a can of spray paint and started spraying into where the water was to hit the actual house paint. And it created a lot of this great texture and you know another piece that i have in my personal collection that i've always kept because it's a reminder of where everything started from yep another one of the ones from junction view days this was another one that started out as so after the first accident from the last piece this is where i actually did a concentrated pour using um just black acrylic paint with water and using the spray paint to kind of make those lines and highlight and using a little bit of cardstock to actually kind of uh, direct where everything I wanted to go. Starting out, I just really wanted to get that figured out. Now, this is one of the first pieces created at, at um, excuse me, 400 West Rich. So this was another one where I started with the with the water, the acrylic, and the spray paint. And uh, and this was actually, you know, a really really good idea. Started or excuse me, was the start of me trying to do these like animal shapes and, and these anamorphic kind of figures. Now this one was, uh, this was, so this was me playing around again and trying to figure stuff out, but this is fountain pen ink. Uh, uh, the Lame Black fountain pen ink that you can just usually get where, you know, when you buy a pen, started using that in a little bit of water and letting that dry. And then it used a little bit of black acrylic in there as well to kind of create this image where it almost gives you this skeletal feel where you almost look like you're looking at an x-ray. Uh, this was one of my favorite pieces that I did uh, early on in Junction View and um, it's now in the hands of a collector. It was in the, uh, featured in the Studio Visit magazine in 2012 as well, but this is all just manipulation. This, was, this, this piece, I think, if I'm not mistaken, took about 25 to 30 hours from start to finish to get to, to get through. And really, really was happy with the way this one turned out what it did. Another one that I kept in my, my, my personal collection, but this one um, is a four foot by four foot. So, you know, you don't really get the size, the scale of it, but um, this is when I started to, learn how I could actually manipulate the paint a little more. This was where I actually tilted the canvas. So as the water was settling in the spot, I would move it a little more to get it to shape, to, to shift. But this is still in the early early stages where it was all just one pour at first. Uh, as we get 
on, we're going to see where it gets like multiple pours. Like for, for example, this one, um, this piece was uh, in the auction for Art for Life in 2014, which was a real big honor. And it's one of my favorite pieces that I've, you know, been able to put out in the wild. It's another four foot by four foot. And um, yeah, really another one where I used a lot of the tilting and manipulating. So. so what I'm noticing, Michael, is you started with landscape and, you know, are pouring yourself, <laughs> pun intended, into your inspirations. Uh -huh. um, and then you have this curiosity that stems from an accident, like yeah. embracing the ephemeral, embracing the unknown. And yeah. then pushing into that. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that parallel to, you know, using art therapy as this leverage of beauty. It, it's a really great kind of reflection of that. And so what I'm seeing is going from that beautiful landscape type thing and then the exploration of these unique beings, or as you said, kind of animal forms. They're, they're definitely, uh, they have shifted from landscape. And then here, it looks like you're joining the two. You're starting to try and merge these uh, different curiosities. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. And, and a lot of that has to do with the, you know, people that I, you know, were around, especially uh, in my Junction View days. Because um, I've always, I've, I learned to have a very good art making process by watching great artists in their studios. Um, you know, I've mentioned Brian's name a bunch. Uh, one of the biggest inspirations, Laura Alexander. Um, she was a mentor in the sense, Stephanie Ron the same way. Um, Ashley Voss is one of the reasons I learned how to do this technique of an overspray. Uh, he's a graffiti artist. So I used to use uh, with the black spray paint with the, the canvas being laid down flat I'm actually using the can and shooting over the canvas to where the spray paint is actually just skipping over the water. And that this is part of that same technique here where I did that around all four edges to kind of push the paint in, in the water in different directions. So it dried in different textures and different layers. And then here, here more so than I think in anything up until this point, you're starting to isolate like, so yes. like recognizing complementary colors and the power that you can use within that. Mm -hmm. um, I really, you know, as we go through these, talk a little bit more about not only your discoveries, but how you implement them going forward. Like how, how is it that you know to continue down that journey of curiosity with something? Yeah, I feel like I've always been one of those people who would love to figure something out. Uh, and if I can, I don't, want to I don't want to try to recreate someone else's will. I want to try to figure something out for myself. Um, and this piece here, the Rose Don't Love You, the Rose Won't Love You, this was created for um, a show at the Cultural Arts Center with uh, for Adam Brulette and Megan Brulette's wedding. And this piece now is in the permanent collection at the Schumacher Gallery, thanks to uh, David Gentilini. And this is another example where I was going back to that merger of trying to bring in this landscape field. This is one of my favorite pieces. This, um, this piece also won third place in the Ohio State Fair Fine Arts uh, Professional Division in 2016. But the concept of this was uh, Adam and I shared the passion for a group um, and a song. It was the Long Vermont Road uh, by the Magnetic Fields. And, you know, we both enjoyed that song a lot and we that was something that we bonded over when we first really kind of started um, talking about art and music and everything and this is kind of i pictured this piece being a a view out of a rainy window like as you're going down a road and and the sun is setting so i was trying to come back to that whole concept of where i loved at first with the landscapes and and bring it into a whole new kind of realm and use that use all of the techniques I had found at one time, you know, with the pouring and the watering down of the acrylic and the overspray of the spray paint and using the enamel to, you know, manipulate the spray paint, you know, where it where it lands. All of that started to come into its this fruition of the same like process that I've been able to continue and and just push every time. 
you know, I don't, I don't ever want to show the same work twice, you know, in that kind of situation. Uh, uh, this piece here, this is another, this was, I went back to doing a single pour. Um, this show was for a show I did at Gallery Denmark. This piece, excuse me, was for a show I did at Gallery, Den uh, Gallery Denmark uh, in the short north, where it was, uh, you know, I wanted to do work based on the blot theory where, you know, or, or just like, you know, see people seeing things in, in the sky. Like, you know, if somebody sees a cloud and they say, you know, it looks like, you know, I don't know, Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> you know, as clouds do sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but this was one of my favorite pieces. This was in um, the 2016 uh, Art for Life and is in a private collection now and is basically two different types of red acrylic paint with spray paint and water uh, and a little bit of white acrylic. Uh, so the darker spots were, you know, where I merged the two reds and the lighter spots that you see towards the bottom there, that pinkish color is where I was adding the white and using the spray paint to kind of manipulate that and break all of that up. You have to be uh, willing to stop yourself uh, when you do something yeah. that has this kind of immediacy. Like there's a real there's a real potential to to lose the beauty of this very quickly. How do you how do you learn to reel it in or not? It's you know it's still it's still a practice that I'm still trying to figure out. Um, I honestly there have been times where I've just been like this is it, this is it. It's done and I just know. And there have been times where I'm like, well, it needs one more thing, and then it's a start over. You know, it's all it's all in the, it's all in the practice of it all. You know. Um, and the more I work, the, the more I find that I find myself even more, you know, cause I, I consistently, you know, I'm trying to paint as much as possible, at least up to five to six times a week, if, if not, you know, every day. Now, so this uh, one, this mm -hmm. one is interesting because the title certainly is reflective of the image. Like there's no, there's no bones about it. Right. So yes. I'm curious. Uh, does the title come first or does the piece come first? So this one, so this one's a little bit, um, this is, this one means a lot to me. Um, it's actually right behind me right now. You can't see it because of the glare, but, <laughs> um, this piece was created in memory of my mom. Um, she had died in 2016, uh, after, you know, having an accident and a long fight of trying to get through it and recovery, but she passed away in September of 16. And I had a show coming up in 17 again at, at gallery denmark and i wanted to i wanted to make a piece that kind of spoke to my relationship with her she was you know not only my big inspiration my my first instructor about learning how to view art and and love it she was a creative herself she you know she made uh flower arrangements and you know she painted t-shirts she was a painter when she lived in germany after college you know she was you know doing landscapes then so she's always been a big inspiration for me as far as my work is concerned. And I wanted to, to make a piece about her. And I've always told people that she was my heart. Like, you know, like the reason I got up and wanted to do something good in the world was because of her. I learned, you know, my volunteerism from her. I learned my politeness, everything, you know, like I learned how to laugh because of her, you know, and enjoy myself and, and not take myself too seriously. Um, and this piece, you know, the title it beats for you is a uh, Jim James song or my morning jacket song, but it, it kind of spoke to my feelings about my mom, you know, and that every day that I woke up, my, my heart was beating because of her and for her. And, you know, I wanted to make it, I wanted to kind of come out and make this heart and make this piece kind of give this, um, this whole detailed heart kind of look in an abstract form. So this one, this one is always going to be something that I cherish and, and probably one of my favorite pieces of all time. Now, this is, this is where I'm going back to trying to do those single pores, but still create some more texture around the edges. Uh, I use the, the overspray, as you can see at the top in the left hand side and really the top of this, it's that that's a lot of the heavy black overspray. And, you know, what I would do is then shoot the shoot the black paint over very hard and then use the acrylic or excuse me use the enamel to break that up and it would actually dissipate so 
that's where you get to see those shadows at that top of the, the line. The pour was uh, probably eight different pours and, and different levels, but I wanted to keep parts of it showing so everybody could see that. Now, this is a piece from the show there at the Rife right now. This was a uh, this piece was in the 2018 Ohio State Fair Fine Arts Division as well. Um, this is where I wanted to kind of make a larger piece that kind of showed a little bit more as far as like me trying to push the, I, the, the concept of texture. Um, Dana Lynn Harper was a great friend of mine and an amazing artist and, and uh, art installation uh, person. I forgot, lost my words here. Said it kind of looks like an aerial map. And you'll see like later on down, I'm gonna get into a little bit more of that, but it was something that she pushed me back in 2018 to kind of do a little bit more. And uh, March 13th of 2020, we were actually putting on a show together with myself, Dana and Jay Moffitt, where I did some more, some work we're gonna see coming on down the line. But um, this piece inspired a lot of the work coming up here soon uh, in the next few slides too. Uh, hey, so this piece was for, uh, this piece I made specifically for Art for Life. This was, um, the Under the Rainbow is, is just, you know, indicative of like me being a, a gay black male and, and still trying to figure out like my coming out story, you know, as, as a young kid. And I wanted to do something that kind of gave that rainbow feel without just throwing a rainbow on a, on a piece of canvas. And, um, and this is where, again, I, I'm going back into trying to push that fluidity between the color mixtures, as well as bring that texture in the back. Michael, you talk a lot about uh, Art for Life, and then you mm -hmm. mentioned softly when talking about that wonderful work for your mother, how she instilled the importance of volunteerism. Um, I wonder, as we go through a couple more pieces, if you could talk a little bit more about one, why you select to uh, give your time and uh, heart to Heart for Life um, and any other organizations. Be it, you, what folks that know you know is that you go in for community and make it better at all turns. So I wanna make sure that those that aren't quite familiar with you get to know that too. Gotcha. No, yeah, definitely. Good. Um... Art for Life is a, a very, um, it's, it's an amazing event. Uh, it, it, it benefits Equitas Health, uh, who started off for uh, any, young, any young gay people in, that were in Columbus in the late 90s, early 2000s, knows Columbus AIDS Task Force, and then they were Arc Ohio, and now they're Equitas Health. But their mission is to help uh, LGBTQ plus community find medical treatment, you know, testing for HIV, finding prescriptions, things like that. They, and they help not only just the, the, they, they basically want to encompass the entire community, the, the whole plus community together. And they want to make sure that everyone has access to good healthcare. And Art for Life is an amazing event that uh, is now in year 30, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm actually on the committee for it this year, the arts committee. So I'll be part of the jury process for uh, the work in the show this year. And it'll be at the Columbus Museum on the 23rd of October. Congrats. Uh, That's a huge honor. Yes. It, you know, I've had some, I've, I've been lucky to have some great honors. And this was the one that I like, you know, hold in the highest esteem. Uh, because it is a great organization and their, their work benefits, you know, a community that I'm a part of and I'm so passionate about. Oh. Now, this piece here was from uh, my first solo show with Haley Gallery in New Albany. Um, Haley approached me in 2016. We had a great we have great working relationship and she represents, you know, she she has my work on display there in her in her amazing store and amazing gallery in New Albany. And um, lucky to have that that opportunity and and that connection as well because Haley is an amazing gallery owner. So, so this one this one is not a single floor. This one is definitely not. So this one, the so a lot of people you know they see that blue in the background and think that's where I started with uh, the pour came first. So uh, what that blue is that that blue is actually the second to last layer. 
that you're seeing in the background. And then there's a layer right after that where it's the the break up, like the broken up gold there. So I, you know, this is where I go in and I I, I refer to it as carving out like what I want to see in the imagery. So, you know, when I, when we, you know, back to that process video, you saw like where it was landing. Once that dries, if there are parts of it that I don't really want to show or, or showcase, I will use like a different color paint to kind of like cover that up a little bit and then go in and do another layer. And, you know, and those, pro that process, again, could take days, months, or hours, just depending on where I land with that pour. You're doing another thing in this work that I noticed as I was looking at the slides. Um, once you get to kind of this place, I recognize mm -hmm. that you are um, having foreground and background argue with each other. Mm -hmm. like you're forcing a viewer to try and figure out what is coming forward because both that really vibrant teal and your chromatic reds and yellows and greens, they're, they're competing. Yeah. And for a moment, you can kind of shift your eyes and concentrate on that mass of yellow and red and green and believe the blue to be in the background. And then if you concentrate right. on that blue, you can do the same, right? So there's, uh, there's some optical illusion that you start getting into. Can you talk a little bit about how you're getting into these really exciting uh, conflicting complements? How, how'd you get there? And yeah, so this show, The Shape of Things, was all about conflict for me. Um, it, it was, you know, a lot of, not only was I looking at the competing colors, but I was also going into the concept of keeping it where you didn't know, like, you know, those optical illusions. Um, you know, Roger Williams, who's an amazing artist here in Columbus, brought that up to um, some work I had done back in 2013. It says, well, you can't really tell what you did here, but I know you did something. <laughs> and that's... And, and that was like the go ahead to keep pushing what I was doing at that time to get to this point. You know, this is another aspect of that where the blue around the brain, <laughs> kind of the the brain there in the middle was was added at the end, you know, where I, so the whole piece is covered in, you know, and paint and, and all these swirls where you see the greens and the blues and the whites. But then I go in and highlight what I want the viewer to see. So and in that, you know, I, I kind of create that same illusion where you actually think you're looking what you, what what's actually in the background is actually the foreground and vice versa. Yeah, another example of that where you know that blue came on second to the last, but I you know wanted to pull uh, wanted to pull my work into a whole nother realm of just trying to still not give enough negative space, but still give, a, or to give enough negative space to make you still want to figure out what's under that blue. Now, this is where I got into a little bit back into that, that single pour stage, but this was for a show I did at the Schumacher gallery in 2019. Uh, it was part of, uh, I've been working on the show, the last slide and this one were part of a, a concept of doing work as in abstract on the seasons, where Cerebral was in spring, this is winter. Um, so yeah, one more back, yep, yeah, that one there. So this would have been spring and uh, yet another spring and then this goes into winter. So uh, summer and, and fall are coming up next, so. <laughs> Uh, this again, another one also in that same vein for the winter. So this, these were all single pours and then a little bit of highlighting and going back in and playing, you know, playing with the white to kind of cover up any imperfections that I did not want the viewer to see. Now this is fall and, uh, this is where I'm getting into this, this concept of these, the golden rich golds with the blues and, you know, trying to get this concept of bringing on this horizon line. Uh, part of the show that I, uh, that I have with Dana and Jay was, we, we were basically trying to push the, the concept of horizon lines and, and doorways and the concept of what's, what are you actually viewing? And and this is kind of the first in that that series of work that I was really happy with immediately. Again, this was from that show, um, the Upper Regions of Air, uh, back in 2020. That uh, 
didn't get to didn't get its due, but you know, due to COVID, we understood why, and you know, we are we we're here we're here now because of the due diligence then. Uh, but again, playing with that that horizon line uh, convergence, this uh, piece I created last year, and uh, this was going into art for life this year, but I started a new piece for that. Uh, but this is again where I where under the rainbow was where I wanted to give those same prideish colors without looking, you know, like without it looking like a rainbow, but still come in with that horizon line and bring that, that, that same next level depth and that, you know, bring that next level of um, transformativeness in that, in that sense. So this is uh, from the seasons as well. This is summer. Uh, this is one of the pieces about summer. And this is again, just, you know, kind of going back into that landscape feel where I just wanted to, show a little bit of that horizon line, but break it up a little bit and not make it so rigid, but also give this viewer this this kind of view. And, and you know, even though it might look like a landscape, you get lost in a little bit of every corner of it. Oh, yeah, so I, I love doing a little bit of abstract flowers every now and then. <laughs> uh, this right now is that strong water, uh, food and, and spirits and and in franklinton and uh which is up uh, i think through the end of this month here um just thought about that and forgot a lot about that but this is a, a a piece that i i really enjoy doing um i like again making figures and you can almost make it out to where it's like some alien where you see a blue eye and a beak but is it a, is, is it a vase of flowers who knows i want to leave that up to the interpretation of the viewer Crush Sun, this one, uh, again, 2020, and this is uh, another one of those, you know, pieces where it's, you know, coming back to doing the landscapes where you have this kind of idea of water and sky and this floating orb over it. Is it the sun? Is it the moon? Is it, you know, another planet? Who knows? But it's up to whatever somebody wants to, to make that interpretation of. Now, 2020 was a hard year for a lot of us. And, and this piece, I think, kind of spoke to the two biggest issues that I saw, well, you know, and, and it's titled The Great Divide for a reason. Um, between ethnicity and gender, like those are the two biggest things that we have a problem with in this country. And it's, you know, I, I wanted to kind of make a piece that kind of spoke to that, you know being a black gay man and, you know, and as, as much of a feminist as I am, I just, I, I see these issues in our country and I get a little frustrated. So I kind of put it out on the canvas and, and because of that, th this is where I'm coming with, but I, you know, again, using that horizon line kind of situation, I flipped it a little bit and went from a different angle, but gave you the competing contrasting colors and in the black and the white and the pink and the blue to kind of symbolize those, those two big areas that, just seem to never get worked out. So, all right. So, what's next? Uh, so happy to announce that I am part of a, a two-man show with my buddy Garrison uh, Latimer at the Sarah Gromley Gallery in the Short North coming up in October. So, something to look forward to. Uh, currently, and 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 again, as I you know failed to mention earlier, but I also am up at uh, have work right now at Strongwater uh, Food and Spirits in Franklinton at 400 West Rich. So you can always check that out. You can always check out my website at emptybush.com, and my IG is at emptybush. So uh, a lot of my new work goes up there. So check it out. And if you ever um, have any questions or you know want to come to see a show in the future, definitely do. Great. Okay, Michael, that was fantastic. We're on to our Q and A. Yeah. Um, so this is the part where you guys get to ask all those burning questions. Um, Michael, you still you like you do so much, and I think you forget to mention all of it. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna help you out a little bit. Let's talk Thanks. a little bit about your involvement in uh, the Franklinton Arts District. Yeah. And how how has that affected your work? Um, so I started hanging out in Franklinton. Laura Alexander invited me to a little shindig that was going on down in Franklinton uh, called Go West. 
And, you know, went down, hung out, you know, met a lot of friends that are still friends today from that night and, you know, started hanging out down in Franklinton more. Uh, Chris Sherman's a big influence of that. He's one of my best friends. And, you know, he's part of the reason why Franklinton is what it is. But uh, 2013, I joined the board of directors for the Franklinton Arts District. Um, you know, and up until that point, had volunteered at uh, the Franklinton Art District number one event, which was Urban Scrawl. You know, at the time, you know, Urban Scrawl, if you're not familiar, is a mural festival where we have artists um, come in and create panels uh, and put them out in the neighborhoods and now uh, actually auctioning them all for the uh, Bellows Fund, which is a grant that we provide to arts, uh, artists and arts organizations in the neighborhood in the neighborhood to be able to create and, and do more in the arts. Um, you know, so this is, I'm on my second run on the board uh, for Franklinson Arts District and we're putting on Urban Scrawl 15 at the last weekend of August. Uh, we're going to do an in-person event where we're gonna have artists spread out and vendors and you know food trucks and community uh, partners are gonna be there with their tents and booths set up so they can definitely you know, help out with that. But for FAD, I've you know, done everything from curating, you know, shows to uh, during the art for the artist for art for life, uh, during the artwork for art for Franklinton, um, you know, and because of that, it's been really enriching in my life because, you know, as an artist, we, we you know, the jury process is something that's still a mystery to a lot of artists, you know, and being a part of that softens up your kind of understanding of if you don't get into a show you don't get upset you know like you know I've heard more no's and I've heard yeses when it comes to shows and I never get offended by it based on the fact that I've had to tell an artist no they couldn't get in you know so I understand that so that's one of the major things being a part of FAD has done so that's great. That's great. And I also you know shout out to naming it the Bellows Fund after you know George Bellows, part of the Ashcan School. If you guys want to get nerdy on your art history, go ahead and have a look up. Um, we do have a comment from Celeste. So beautiful, Michael. Thank you for sharing your moving art to honor your mom. Thank you, so. Celeste. Yeah, Thank lovely. You. And then Amy would love to hear more about the trials of being self-taught in the process of experimentation. What's a typical day in the studio like? And how do you handle failure and frustration in the studio? So for me, like, again, like it all started with art therapy. So it, to me, it's never a sense of, I had to hit it out of the park every time. I, I like to make mistakes or mess something up so I can figure out how to do it better later on. Um, you know, I probably, again, I'm six to seven days a week. Like, you know, I'm usually trying, there's a paintbrush or something in my hand, trying to create something at, every day of the week. And with that, you know, there are always going to be mistakes and there's always going to be an oops moment or ah, I wish it just didn't do that. But, you know, finding that, that balance of knowing that it's not that, you know, it's not that I, I don't, I'm not depending upon it to be, you know, like a masterpiece every time. It's part of the process for me. It's just the enjoyment of it all. Like, you know, I, I want to make those mistakes so I can figure out how to change it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but self-taught, I mean, the thing that with me, even though, even though I say I'm self-taught, I've had a lot of mentors. So, you know, I mentioned Laura Alexander, mentioned Stephanie Rock, Kat and Lisa, both, you know, like they've all been, even if they don't know they're teaching me things, I'm watching them and their practice and I'm learning from it, you know, and, and, you know, Andrew Ian is another one who helped me push that color, you know, palette, you know, he was one that just said, why are you, you know he looked at me when we were at 400 together he looked at me and goes why are you still so scared of color and i was like i'm not scared i promise you <laughs> i like using different colors he's like well maybe try something besides blue and green i was like fair so <laughs> I, I i know my wheelhouse back then and it's push sets but yeah <laughs> that's great okay so we have one comment and then sarah has a question a mm -hmm. comment from Donna Collins, our executive director, uh -huh. the joy in your voice reflects the joy I feel when I see your work and learn about your process. Thank you. No, oh, thank you so much. And Sarah. Hi. Hi. Sarah. I, uh, this Hi. Is, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, 
you kind of started to answer it just now, but um, but maybe you could go more into it. You talked about like this sort of initial accident of like the paint spilling in your studio and then like, ooh, you getting in and wanting to play with it. And so I was just kind of wondering if you, um, like we, we see all the finished products, but like, do you uh, have like a practice of like incorporating accidents or like trying to mess your stuff up in ways that like uh, to, to per intentionally like harvest the, the unexpected in order to like, uh, you know, cause you need a certain amount of chaos. I mean, what you do already like generates enough chaos to like for a few lifetimes but yeah do you, do you ever like set out to like um hit yourself with accidents <laughs> yeah um yeah actually sometimes you know you have to like you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet you know so sometimes you have to kind of get into that where you just like it's not going where I did just flip it, you know, just <laughs> toss it in the air and see what happens, you know, because it's not working out to where it's at now. And you've seen me, you know how I get, Sarah, you've seen my studio, you know, it's a mess in there. It's like paint falling off the ceiling, who knows, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Nancy. Are you interested in contemporary artwork being created in other countries? 100%, you know, I, I feel like that is, that's pivotal, but I, you know, was, Instagram has been great with me being able to follow contemporary artists all across the world, you know, so like, you know, that's been like, you know, part of my daily routine is to go through Instagram and just flip through all the art that I can find, you know, especially contemporary art, you know. So, um, what I was really enjoying when we were taking a look at your work, Michael, mm -hmm. is that uh, by the time we get to your current work, it is um, an, an introduction of all of your learnings. So, <clears throat> you know, at the very beginning, we see Rothko in these clear divisions of space and color. Um, and then you kind of let that go and you go into these more abstract ideas and then abstract forms and then exploring color. And then you pull Rothko back in and you start pulling that, that line across. Yeah. And so um, I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about when you are creating a piece, where are you pulling your inspiration from or is it completely ethereal based on reaction to what happens? Um, or maybe both, like talk talk a little through that. Yeah, a little column A, a little column B, you know? Um, Cause it's, you know, for me, like I, I, I talk about how much I work, but the reason why I do it is because, you know, I work in, a, in an environment where I use one side of my brain all day. It's, you know, financial, it's learning, you know, how to, how to, and any of my state employee friends out there will understand how to figure out oh, how to revise code or, you know, any of that, you know, and kind of understand that. So, so when I go to paint, this is my relaxing time. This is my chance for me to just unwind for the day. And music plays a lot of part of that because I, you know, I listen to music while I paint and I kind of just unwind. I, I actually try to forget any stressful aspects of the day and try to focus in on the music and focus in on the process of the painting. So I think a lot of this for me is where I can think about what I want to see, but I don't let that thought drive the actual process. I, you know, I let the actual process drive itself, you know, so I'm almost, a, I'm almost, more of a secondhand person in the process while the materials are doing all the work, you know? I'm just there more like to chaperone. Like... So then if I'm hearing you correctly, does that mean that the title comes second? Cause you didn't answer that question yet. Uh -huh. It does. A lot of times it does because I, you know, I'm definitely, um, you know, thinking about the work as it happens, but then, you know, once I finish it, it could be just that the title came from the song I was listening to as I was working on it, you know, at a, at a pivotal point, you know, and, you know, comes from that, but a lot of it, 
you know, I always joke that, you know, if, if, it, if it wasn't for Fiona Apple, I would never be able to title a painting because uh, a lot of my work is inspired. You know, a lot of the titles are inspired by songs from her. She's one of my favorite artists to listen to her, Erica Badu. You know, they're, they're very relaxing, very calming voices that help me get into making the work. That's great. We have a comment from Barb Vogel. Oh, uh, Barb. Barb says, love your controlled accidents. Yes, you, Laura, Dana, and Stephanie are all so wonderful. I love your horizon lines and, of, car of course, your heart. Oh, Barb's a, Barb is an amazing artist. If you guys don't know Barb's work, you need to go check it out because she is absolutely fantastic. Agreed. And, someone, and, you know, and someone who I've been able to just sit down and pick her brain about art, you know, she's always been very helpful and, you know, a big mentor to me as well. A gem, a gem in the city for sure. Yes, yes, yes. A uh, question from Amy. I'm wondering what mediums you haven't explored yet and are interested in. What's the next experiments? Um, so a few years back, Duff Lindsay and I were having a conversation and he, he challenged me to enamels, like as far as enamel paint. And I've, you know, I've toyed around a little bit a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I was like, I'm going to give it a full run one day and try to figure that out. Like, and see if I can do with enamels what I can do with acrylics. Um, you know, and, you know, Duff's, you know, been a great person to talk to and learn from as well, because, you know, learning the gallery side and learning how that works is something he's been, you know, always willing to help me, you know, help me by answering questions and things like that. So he's been a great uh, influence in my, my career as well. But enamels um, are it. Enamels are it. They're next. <laughs> exciting. It's exciting. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Um, Celeste, did you have a question? I saw you wave. Yes, go for it. Thank you so much. Hi, Michael. Hi, Celeste. Hi. Um, thank you for this incredible presentation. Your work is just so moving. And I was really, I love the aspect of, um, of the randomness that you welcome you don't just allow but you welcome it into your work and I really mm -hmm. relate to that working with fiber but I wondered if this is a strange question but I'm so curious so I have to ask <laughs> I wondered if have you worked with water from different sources to see if that you know like you, you your work so spiritual and like I don't know and it feels like the the materials themselves could like you just said influence your work so I, and I just wondered about the sourcing like water it's something that you know comes from all these different sources yeah so I've done I've used you know of course tap water but I've also used a lot of filtered water in the past and you can tell a difference a lot of times in the way the paint mixes uh filtered water usually keeps pigment better you know a little bit more so if it's something like when I did uh, Heavy as the Head, where the, the red and white piece that was in Art for Life in 2016, that was all filtered water. And that kept the pigment so red and that it just stayed, it just lit up the canvas. So, but tap water, I mean, it's it's good for its thing. So, <laughs> I think Celeste. Celeste is about to take you on a trip around the state to get oh, some, about some water from Crete. I think that's what's about to happen. We're going to do some well trips and grab some uh, mason jars and just hit the road, Celeste. Let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you borrow my labeler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Jennifer Witten, one of our other exhibiting artists who just did an artist talk. Jennifer says, I loved hearing about your process and how you trust that process again and again. Practical question. Do you wear protective gear? Gloves? maybe as you work with the spray? Um, so my good friend, Jay Moffitt, uh, who's been a, somebody I went to high school with, you know, he's, he's an amazing artist. Um, he's been yelling at me for years to get a spray mask and I finally got one. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's about the one thing I do. Um, my space was always well ventilated. I had a giant fan pulling everything out so it wouldn't stay and linger, but Working with spray enamel and, and spray paint, you know, sometimes you have to come and take a Q-tip and make sure you don't have black stuff in your nose because you've just been huffing that the whole time. So, you know, I know that's TMI for most, but, the, you know, that was one of those situations like you have to kind of protect yourself in that situation now. 
Disclaimer, anyone that is choosing to work with spray paint or toxic materials, you should always wear gloves and face masks to be sure that you are as safe as possible because those things can have lasting impact on your body. Those chemicals yeah. that enter your body um, will not exit. Right. The more you know. The more you know. Yes. I think that uh, this has been a really phenomenally joyful conversation. I, I want to kind of cap us off on leaning back into the fact that this is an exhibition about being, you know, an artist and a state employee. You talked a little bit about um, kind of the rigidity of, of your role and that there's not room for mistakes. There's, it's very precise, it's very analytical, and it's super important that you get it right. You know, it's like mm -hmm. folks' retirements in your hands. Yeah. Um, so good. I'm glad that you you have that recognition. And um, I would love for you to talk about the balance that I, you told me a little bit about this already. So I kind of stole your thunder, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> that art gives you. Um, and if you take one away, either side, how do you feel that would affect you? I, you know, I always joke, like, you know, it's like somebody's always asked, you know, people ask, why aren't you, are you ever going to make the full-time artist jump? And I said, you know, for me, I like the security of having healthcare, <laughs> you know, like, not like I couldn't do it, but it's, it's hard for me. Like, like OPERS provides me the opportunity to be able to go into it and afford a studio, afford materials to be able to create work and the work, the, the painting allows me to be able to go back to work with a fresh mind every day. So there's this ebb and flow where they both play into each other. You know, it, like you said, it is, it's a hard job and it, and it's something that, you know, I always have to wake up in the morning and think I have to make sure I'm making the best decisions that I can to make sure that, you know, people are getting, making sure that they get their retirement done, you know, and things like that. So Opers has always been something, has been a blessing to me because of the fact that they, are very generous with their time and they allow me to work from home now, you know, things like that. So like, you know, my, my dogs love that. Uh, and also like, you know, 15 minute go in and run into the garage studio, make a start a painting and then come back into work, you know, if I have to <laughs> kind of situation, but yeah, they both play a part in who I am as a person, you know, in, in full, um, you know, I love being able to help others, uh, especially with something that they're not familiar with or, didn't understand, you know, and I like to, you know, with the reps that we have that, you know, take calls, my job is to help them find the answer sometimes. And that's something I really enjoy. I really enjoy showing people what I already know. Like, you know, if something, if I know something, I want to share it, you know, um, but the art allows me to be able to come back and, and every day and come in with a fresh mind and a gratitude for what I'm doing. So. I love that you see that in both uh, kind of areas of your life, like you're, you're a helper in all areas that, that spans across and that's just so lovely, right? Thank you. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with us? I, you know, this being my very first artist talk, you know, I told, I told you earlier, you know, I was real nervous about this, but this has been a great experience and I want to thank you and Amy for everything. And, you know, just so excited that this show is still going on. This is my second time being in the show. So it was, uh